Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Happy Being Well. I have a really, really, really exciting guest today. We have with us Steve York. He is a former hostage negotiator, uh, speaker, and author. So Steve is going to speak with us on the topic of self-confidence. And you know, Steve's also appeared on Netflix on the negotiator series um, in one of the episodes. And so I'll give a little, before we dive deep into Steve's intro, this podcast is sponsored by happybeingwell.com, your online store for leggings, crystals, sage, Palo Santo, 100% natural facial masks, 100% natural deodorants, bath soaps, essential oils, and more at happybeingwell.com. Use code PODCAST25 for 25% off all leggings, free shipping in the USA. So uh, so I'm going to introduce Steve, and then we're going to jump in into an exciting conversation with Steve, giving us a few tips on, oh, I can't minimize the window. I can't access the bio. Okay. Uh, I'm going to minimize this. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm a little tech. Not good, which, okay. So after 20 years of working in the police crisis negotiation task force, he decided to come out of his own way to share his wisdom and provide life-changing training seminars for people who influence behavior, may it be in the corporate world or not. Steve is the co-author of an Amazon best-selling book, Negotiation Evolved, that offers a comprehensive approach to negotiation and influence that can be applied in every situation from large commercial deals to romantic partnerships and even hostage crises. He is currently competing his second in the second in the area of high-risk negotiation, tentatively titled Crisis Negotiation Evolved. Steve has been featured in Netflix, Sky News, and CBS. He has lectured and provided training to government agencies, universities, private companies across the globe. So Steve, welcome to the Happy Being Well podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome from Australia. Yes, Steve is from Australia. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> um, so we're going to be like talking about, I figured we talk about self-confidence and, you know, since you have a, I mean, the art of negotiation requires such a, it, it's the art of communication and the art of, you know, really understanding the human psyche. So what better than you to speak on self-confidence? Um, a lot of people struggle with self-confidence, self-confidence, you know, whether they're going to be one of these speakers or you know any type of pre presentation or whatever it is they want to sh how they want to show up in life um what would you say how does one like get better at self or build self-confidence based on your experience i would imagine I computer, you would have to demonstrate self-confidence in, in, in the negotiation as well to kind of yeah, that's right that, that's exactly right um i think that you know, my, my uh, journey um, was through the police force. And, of course, going through that, going through that training and through that um, life experience, you know, everyone looks to a police officer to be able to solve a problem. Um, and I tell you that there's nothing worse than a police officer that doesn't have uh, confidence because that's very infectious, uh, sort of not having confidence, it just, it's like a virus. Um, it goes through it goes through the whole crowd, you know, whatever. But the reverse is true, that if you do show confidence, and even if you can make bad decisions, you're making decisions and leading people, your confidence will rub off and people will follow. And until, you know, everyone has time to regroup and rethink and, and reflect, um, you know, I might say, well, we made the wrong decision, but at the time, you know, I was confident we were making the right one. And I think that's that's quite interesting when you when you look at that, and some some leaders actually do that, and they have a 
they have a following because of that confidence. Um, I've met a, a girl who um, called Kelly who had no confidence at all. She was a an immigrant to Australia from from Asia. Uh, she found it hard making friends, uh, but she she changed her life by doing some training, uh, setting herself some goals, um, acting confident, even though she, she wasn't, but acting confident. And um, she then wrote a book uh, called 100 Lunches. And uh, she, what she did was to, to demonstrate to herself that she had the ability uh, and confidence to be able to meet and greet anybody she set out to have 100 lunches with strangers. And the interesting thing is, I think only two people didn't turn up to her lunches. Um, so, you know, basically 100 people did, two, two didn't. Um, she was able, she said that at no time was a conversation um, forced or was there any, any, you know, gaps in it. And it was because she set herself the task, she planned, she prepared, she had the questions in her mind. And a bit like what you said today is there's a natural course of the, of the conversation. And if you're confident, you can follow the, that natural course. And now that person, Kaylee, is, you know, a TED speaker. She's got, she's got clients uh, that, she, that she trains and teaches people in communication skills and uh, this approach. And, and where did it come from? from? First of all, you know, establishing what's the mission? Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? Looking at who, who are my role models? What do I want to be like? What? Because if you can see it, you can be it. And that's what she did. She picked up role models and said, right, I, I want to be able to react and act like that. And then it's about preparation. What's my, if you like, A list questions? What's my B list questions? And what's my questions if nothing else works that I can use use those questions and be absolutely prepared for that? Um, and I think though, if you start a conversation, you have, you know, what your end in mind is, that you can naturally lead a person down that. And um, you know, the people that interview. You know, um, journal, good journalists and good TV interviewers are very good at this. Um, they have a general idea where they want to end up, but they don't plan every step. They plan their A questions, B questions, and, you know, C questions, which are, you know, if it all goes to hell, what do I do? Um, and I think, so going back to your question, first of all, can people learn this? Absolutely. Do you need it in negotiation, particularly crisis negotiation, hostage negotiation, absolutely. How do you train for it? And I, I teach about um, training through games. In other words, training through scenarios, um, setting up real life situations that would mimic the real setting and then going through that and repeating it just as you would any other skill and making sure that you've got the ability to be able to uh, to communicate in that form. It's a long answer, but I really <laughs> want to it, paint it, the foundation. It's the truth. So basically the old adage of practice makes perfect. And uh, I just, you know, self-confidence is something that I think a lot of, I think people always feel like they, you know, want to aspire to get more self-confidence, more self-confidence, but it really just starts with, you know, taking action initially, but most importantly, you know, staying consistent. And, you know, I can imagine that's someone a, being, yeah. That's a very good point around consistency. Humans do not like inconsistency. You know, you can pick up inconsistencies because it comes from, you know, the, the old reptilian brain we all have that says inconsistency could mean death. You know, this is about if something's inconsistent in your environment, it could be dangerous. And that's what um, I think that people 
you know, like perceive that very quickly. But they don't even know they're perceiving it. They just get that gut feeling that something's wrong. Mm, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, negotiation, it, it, we're, all, we're always involved in a negotiation process too. Like, you know, talking to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or, you know, whoever, like in a, in a romantic relationship, either you're trying to negotiate over, you know, where to go on your next vacation, or you're in some kind of fight over who's right or who's wrong, or, you know, squabbles like that. I mean, to resolve that, that is a form of negotiation. And now, I would imagine that would be a lot different than versus like, in a negotiation with the stranger, maybe if like, if you're so close to that person there's a lot of emotions att attached to your romantic relationship right because it's so easily to get so emotionally intertwined versus having an I think, the, I think the best way to describe this and i think you're absolutely right um that there is there is a difference but it's the same process mm -hmm. it's the same process it's like like what am i what am i experience the stories is, you know, I, I come back from um, negotiating a, a situation with the police and I come home and my wife's standing there and she says, all right, Mr. Big Tough Negotiator, go and talk to your daughter because she's not cleaning up her room. And I go in and I say, Ruby, can you please clean up your room? She goes, no. I'm not cleaning up my room. Mum makes me angry. I'm not going to do it. And I'm almost begging, please, Ruby, clean up your room because if you don't, my life is not going to be worth living out there. Now, there's a couple of things operating. One is Ruby, my daughter, just believes that Dad will love her no matter what she does. So she has the power in the relationship. I have a situation where I'm trying to balance the relationships of a lot of things and, you know, not also that I'm supposed to be a good negotiator and yet I can't even negotiate my daughter to clean up a room. <laughs> and, of course, my wife saying, you know, it's too hard for me, I'll, I'll push it over there and I, I want you to clean it up. Otherwise, you know, there's going to be no dessert for you. Um, so all those relationships are operating all the time and you've got to understand what, what is there to be able to do with it. And, um, you know, this happens in all sorts of relationships, but you look at, you get even on world politics, you know, even the Russian-Ukraine situation is a negotiation. You know, people say, oh, that's just a you know, conflict, a war, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, no. The, the Russians are communicating with China, they're communicating with the USA, communicating with all neighbours, saying that, you know, we take our, our territory seriously. We take our, um, you know, what we, you know, communicate seriously. And, of course, the Ukrainians are saying, well, not going to be pushed over, you know. We know we are negotiating for our sovereignty. And so all these things are happening, and you may not ever understand the true relationships between Ukraine president and Russian president with all the other parties. The only way to do it is trying to work through and research all those parties so from your particular perspective, you understand it. So from an outsider looking in, in my house when I'm trying to beg my daughter to clean up a room, um, you just go, well, you're the father. Why don't you just tell her to do it, make her do it? No, because at that particular moment, I've got to do it in a way that I'm not affecting any other relationship. So these complexities happen in every house across the world. And sometimes I say, you know, in every house at six o'clock at night, you know, the same conversations are happening through probably a billion households. And that is, you know, clean up your room, have your shower, come for dinner, all those sort of things. And it's all a negotiation about how people, work, how people live with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, yeah, I mean, you know, or maybe try to find, try to like, try to, I don't know, I, it's been so long since I've been a teenager, <laughs> try to find some kind of value associated with cleaning up her room, maybe. Like if you clean up your room, I don't know, your discipline skills will increase. That's not appealing to a teenager. Um, but yeah. You've got to remember the time period, you know. That if you've got time, you can you can sell that, you know, over time. If you do that, this is what will happen. But in that short negotiation time, it that, it, that time compression, all those little things that you can do and subtle touches can't happen. And so you've got to be able to discuss it in a consistent way that is consistent with the way you do things every single day. Because if you come in and act inconsistent, that just, you know, everyone gets scared about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, when you're in a negotiation, like, let's just say, you know, with someone you barely know, like maybe it's some, it's like maybe a business negotiation um, or a negotiation at work. So maybe like someone you some, somewhat know, like, um, you like, what's the first, you, of course you mentioned, you have to know your, your outcome. You have to know, you know, what, what it is you want, but how do you, basically win the negotiations throughout that process throughout the negotiation process like what does that look like how do you i know i always hear you know like whoever has the most conviction um typically you know wins the sale right um so how do you what is that there's, there's a two there's two things there one is a short-term negotiation versus long-term negotiation, short-term negotiation or single cycle negotiations, you know, that's bargaining really. That's that's saying, you know, I want to buy that for $8. The seller says, no, it's 12. You talk about it, you you downgrade it in, in your mind or their mind saying, oh, look, it's got flaws, blah, blah, blah. It's only worth $8. And they say, no, no, you can't get this. This is the cheapest you can get anywhere. You know, that's bargaining. It is a negotiation, but it's, it's truly bargaining. You're not saying, I want to do with this person again. I'm not saying I'll be back to buy more. You're saying that's it's just a transaction, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's, you know, it's a workplace and, and inevitably, no matter if you don't want to ever see someone else again, well, it's a small place. You always run across people again and usually... If you've had a bad relationship, they're the ones that always come back in some form. And they could be in a powerful situation where um, they'll revisit how you left them. So I always think in long term. Um, I mean, I've had I've gone into situations and you know, my work colleagues say, Steve, you know, you're supposed to be this tough negotiator. How come we left with, you know, with money on the table or you know, we accepted that. And I said, they think the negotiation finished there. The negotiation hasn't finished. That's, that's stage one. I said, let's talk to them. Let's, you know, judge it when we go back to stage two and three. And, of course, it's about building that relationship, building a working relationship, establishing a consistent behaviour, establishing trust and building that trust and thinking long term, and that's the way um, I've always operated. For example, you know, um, I always amaze, amaze my colleagues because I know the name of uh, the local barista and the local service person at the cafe. And um, I said, "Well, how can you know these people?" I said, "Well, do you know if you treat them like people, they actually respond." And you build a relationship. I said, I don't save any money, but I'll guarantee you I'll be the first to be served when I walk into the into the cafe. And I'll guarantee you that if I don't like something, I'll go and make sure it is right. Now, I haven't, um, there's a couple of that. We talk about confidence. 
That's one of the things. You demonstrate. You're confident enough to be asked the person your name. You're confident enough to, to give them your name. You're confident enough to, to walk in and say, you know, look, here's, I don't like that stuff, but here's what I really like. So if I come in and I'm looking for lunch, you'll know I'll be looking for salad and this sort of stuff. Those sort of relationships are built on confidence. If you came, if you came in and acted like, you know, um, you know, I'm the last person you'd ever want to serve and I don't want to talk and you close down, people are going to treat you like that. They'll treat you like you don't want to be talked to, you, you know, like you won't, you won't be the first person they go to because it's just awkward. Um, and that relationship is very, very, uh, again, transactional. It's not long-term. And so this is just an example about building relationships, working relationships. It doesn't mean that they'll invite you home or it doesn't mean that they'll invite you out for a meal, but it does mean that in, the, in that context, they understand you and your needs and you can negotiate the way you're treated and, and the outcome. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of like, you know, how you present your yourself or the expression, you know, throughout, let's, you know, I don't know, I'm going to relate it to me perhaps a business. I think, I think, my, I think a lot of people can relate to maybe a business negotiation. Um, yep. And so do you, you know, do you want to come off as warm and bubbly? you know, when you start off the negotiation or do you want to come off as, you know, as if you know what you're talking about, you know, demonstrating authority as opposed to having, being warm and bubbly with a smile on your face. Will that? Well, it's contextual, but, but generally, you know, think about your, you want to be confident. You want to exclude that confidence. So that might be, um, you know, the way you talk and everything, because the last two years we've been on video conferences and, and audio conferences, and there's a lot you can, people actually take a lot out of, you know, the way you say things. Um, you know, you, I, I, I put it out there that you can almost tell when someone's lying down in bed um, and you say, are you still in bed? Yeah. Go, no, 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 I'm up. You wouldn't believe it, I'm up, I'm, you know. And you go, no, nah, they're still on bed. Yeah. And why is that? Because we listen so intently for all the clues. And we're very good at it. But sometimes we don't actually identify it ourselves. We don't say, well, that, why would that be? Um, yes, okay. So that I understand that's why that's happening. Um, and you can do it in microseconds when you, you're well trained. Um, but definitely leading off a negotiation is around what's the context, what is happening. You know, you might want to, it might be advantageous to have someone, well, they're a bit tired, you talk to them and say, I need to, you know, understand these three things, I need these three questions answered. Um, that's going to be advantageous to you to get that answer right away, rather than give them time to think about it and come back with a position. Um, and it might be the reverse. So, but being consistent, having a, a low and slower tone, than the other party um, is important because people will match that. If you're bubbly and hyper and you know going other place, it tends to lift the other party to match you in that. So if you can set the tone uh, and set the pace, that people will match it, mm -hmm. and that again, you know, allows people to to sort of understand how you operate and fit in with you. But definitely research, preparation and research underpins all this. Who you're talking to, you know, what are your needs? What are their needs? You know, what's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, as Fisher would say? Um, you know, how, how do you treat this person? Is it going to be one of a number of negotiations or is this just a bargaining situation? And I say always try and build a relationship. Because you know that person comes around again, and you pick up where you left off. Awesome! I love that. Um, that's awesome. I love all those points, and 
So if anyone wants to learn more about you, Steve, like where can they go and find out more about you and, and how, and where to, and where to buy your book and, um, and you're also, are you offering training now on how to negotiate your, yeah, we, we're offering training, um, negotiate and, you know, and do some individual stuff. We can do some coaching for negotiation teams. Um, for example, I've uh, coached a, a team that was involved in a, you know, hundred or so million dollar um, telecommunications contract. And, uh, you know, all these, the, the team had a, a lot riding on it, a lot, a lot riding on it personally and a lot riding on it in their career. And really, they had all the skills, but just needed someone to, you know, try this and try that, and this this sometimes works, and and that sort of coaching can really really assist people to to, to go along, and it does give confidence that that you know that you know there's someone else saying, well, you're on the right track. It certainly you know gives that gives that confidence. But for me, um, you can find me on steveyork.com.au and on LinkedIn and those sort of places. Um, more than happy to have conversations on the phone, um, just to, if I can help people. Um, you know, that period of my life, that uh, it's all about, you know, it's all about helping other people and uh, passing off what I've had, had, you know, 35 years negotiating, both as a hostage negotiator and business negotiation, um, and training in the academic in the academic world. Um, yeah, I'd love to be able to help people. Awesome, guys. So, you know, head over to steveyork.com.au and, you know, to learn more about Steve, uh, go check out his book, uh, check out, you know, his training programs, contact him if you want to work with him. Thank you so much, Steve, for pouring into the Happy Being Well audience. Um, and delivering, you know, insights and, you know, some tips on how to build some self-confidence and how to be a better negotiator. So thanks so much. And guys, if you like this episode, subscribe and sending love and light to you all. And remember, be happy being well. Bye, guys.